Our guest speaker this morning is Piers Steele. Piers is a professor at UC in the Organizational Behavior and Human Resource area and is the Brookfield Research Chair at the Haskane School of Business. He's a recognized authority on the science of motivation and is known internationally for his productivity research, uh, receiving widespread media coverage. Piers' particular areas of research include culture, motivation, and decision-making. He is also currently driving a systematic review of ethical research with the goal of identifying what is known and where knowledge gaps lie and in sharing the knowledge in a practical and accessible format. He has expertise in systematic review and meta-analysis, having published over 25 scholarly articles on the topic and is a member of the Society of Research Synthesis and Methodology. He has published several methodology papers on how to improve meta-analysis. So uh, please help me welcome Piers Steele. Here we are. Well, thank you. Uh, I, you always sound wonderful when you get to write it yourself. I don't think. The, uh, yeah, that meta-analysis part just makes it actually mean that I'm good at summarizing other people's research. But, uh, but really, it, it is, this is, a lot of people say research is mean search, right? And um, though, don't read in too much of that, because I've also done work on um, sexual harassment, workplace violence, and driving with a cell phone. And I like to think I don't do all of those. However, my procrastination stuff does kind of have a warm spark to my heart. Because, yes, it, it's actually in, in this type of profession, unstructured one. You know, basically, you know, being a professor is like, go out and do things, you know, publish something somewhere on a topic of your choosing, the time you're choosing, but do it quickly. And so it's really very, very unstructured. And you actually have to kind of figure out these things for yourself because the motivation doesn't really come from around you as much. You have reasons to do it, but to structure time in a, in a productive way is really difficult. They say that, you know, they almost give you, they give you enough rope that you can hang yourself with it, right? So there's been a lot written about procrastination, of course. I mean, it, this is really the human condition. One of my favorite, actually, I have is from Langston Hughes called about Harlem. And uh, it is a short one, so it's perfect for this condensed timeline. Um, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it drive like a ray from the sun or fester like a sore? and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode, right? So in the sense, so this is, his thing had more kind of um, social justice overtones to it. The idea of, of that when we put something off, there, there's consequences to it. There's this kind of a, a self-harm and we'll be getting into that that this is something we kind of do to ourselves despite us not wanting to. So I'll go over it. Let me just switch your screen. I, as a professor, it's very difficult for me to speak without PowerPoints. So if, if you don't mind, if I actually kind of give a few just to kind of go forward. And uh, yeah, I actually did write a book on the topic. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me. Yes. Um, but one of my first places actually got published was in Yes, in 2004, Yes, Science Magazine for Kids. And actually, it's called a equation because if you look carefully, there is an equation there. But if it's, it's if 12-year-old if science kids can get it, I think the rest of us can too. Um, though I was rather kind of surprised by how sophisticated they are. But it just kind of does emphasize that it is a really common element. Now we'll be going over this a little bit more detail, but when that equation basically only has a few components of which we'll cover a little bit more, and then elements that decrease motivation on the bottom. And even if you don't like the math, you can just kind of go in the components. So that's a preview. We'll get into that a little bit more in a moment. Now it is everywhere. 
Now, here, for example, we te we we tested about ten thousand people on a one to five scale. So one is they don't procrastinate at all. Five, they procrastinate all the time. And we found, for example, a lot of range of people. <coughs> But even at the kind of the highest level, right? Actuaries and food servers were not thing, were not that different in terms of self-report. Now, this means that when you do something earlier, it's like, oh, oh my God, I did it early. I should put it on TikTok or Instagram or whatever, right? It, it's it is a surprise that something ever gets done ahead of time. If it wasn't for the eleventh hour, the last minute, nothing would get done. This is this is the default for most people not to do it ahead of time. It's also fun, common enough, it's kind of funny. This is actually Les Walsh. He was an advertising exec, executive and he, uh, a famous prankster. And he used to do these annual predictions, um, always a year late, unfortunately, but 100% correct. So he would predict what would happen during the year, but he would be a year late giving it out. He would always do it in a funny, particular way. He also kind of went and had a little trip to the Whitechapel Foundry, which made the Liberty Bell and demanded a refund because there was a crack in it. He was that type of guy. But we can have a lot of fun with procrastination because it's kind of one of our human foibles. We can make fun of it as we make fun of ourselves. So here's one about hard work often pays off after time, but laziness always pays off now. We have um, this one about procrastination. The job's worth doing, it'll still be worth doing tomorrow. You know, and of course, um, there's that famous, famous procrastination joke, which you all know. So I'll tell it to you later. The thinker. All right, so common part of the workplace, right? It is, it is normal. And if, uh, if there's a procrastination pope, I will take the position and I absolve you of your procrastination sins. It's, it's, it's normal to procrastinate, but that doesn't mean it's actually helpful. Um, it is kind of very, very difficult to kind of overcome in any venue. Here's a, these points, when you start a, a task, it has to start at zero. When you finish, it has to finish up 100%. But that line in between, that's slow and steady, right? Does that reflect your, your kind of work pace? And I would say probably not. Right. Here's one we actually did it with a you know giant massive open online course, and we tested a lot of students. And is the key either slipping down and then coming back up, which wasn't so bad. But here was one student. And you can take a look at that in the middle. That's almost like a flat line, which means work, work, no work, no work, no work, no work. And then you can you can imagine the mindset right here. You know, like ah, boom, right. Now, if only we could capture that and put it in a bottle. Boy, the what we're all capable of at the final moment is mind blowing. If any one of us could actually have that all the time, world watch out. You know, we, we would be like, you know, like an army. We'd be the, 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 the you know, we would take on entire platoons of people. You know, I, we actually limit, it's actually doing 12 time regular pace. The work of 12 people at the end, amazing. But you see it everything in work teams. And this one, we had a lot of data, so the lines are really smooth. And it's US Congress, number of bills enacted, right? So the question is, of course, um, why do we do it and what is it, right? And is it you're someone lazy, right? You're just, you're not doing it lazy. And I would give an emphatic no, no. Because there's one thing that lazy people don't do. They don't intend to work. If you made intention to work, I said, and you want it, that doesn't make you lazy, right? But there's an action, an intention gap. And that's where, where the actual problem is. And we kind of struggle against it. We don't want to want not to work. So we can put it up into a kind of a more full-blown definition. And that's when we voluntarily, we're not can't be forced, to put off our intention to work. We had an intention to work despite expecting to be worse off. Now I can make that a little simpler, putting off despite being worse off, which makes it kind of self-harm. So if you're saying, well, I'm, I'm procrastinating, but it's fine because it's all to my advantage. I'd say I call that uh, scheduling maybe, you know, you're scheduling your work, that's fine. 
Um, Woody Allen said, time is nature's way of preventing everything from happening at once. So you can't have everything happening once you have to schedule. And it's when you decide to do a less important thing when you know you should be doing a new, more important thing, that's procrastination. And by the way, it's by your own standards. It's whatever you think. If you want to go out and say, no, I, I've got to tend to my physical well-being, my mental health, and that has to be a priority. That's not procrastination. It's by your own standards and belief about what is a good life. It's when, despite knowing that, you still put it off. Now, there can be kind of areas of uh, pockets of prevalence. Like, for example, um, younger than older, for those of us who've had children, we know that we have to be almost their walking self-control units and making sure they have everything. Um, you know, the amount of kids that forget their passports or to pack for vacations is ridiculous. They tend to be poorer than richer. They tend to be men rather than women. Does this surprise any women that we tend to procrastinate? No, it never does. Uh, single or separated rather than married, which means they put off starting commitment as well as ending it, which I thought was interesting. They tend to have a little less education and they also tend to be from Ireland. We did a kind of a big international study. So if you find a young, poor Irish single man who you know what you got, right? Um, and we can go through and actually do it in any particular order, but this is survey says what they actually ask. So I can actually do a little thing, but it's better if it's more interactive. But in this venue, people can't shout out quite as easily. So I'll just pick some things. So if you think to yourself, what is number one, right? What's the most common element of procrastination? And somebody said, doing their file folders, organizing their file folders. Yes, that is number one, organizing. So if you're putting off organizing, yes, you're there. These number two is career, career elements, which is still really important. Three is health, lifestyle changes. Four is finance. And five is education. Um, and because of this, these things are all really important to us. That when we put off these elements, often there's a tinge of regret. Now, this is actually worse than actually going for it and then failing. Having gone for things and being unsuccessful really hurts at the time. It's no two ways about it. Ah, I've been there many times. But after a year or two, sometimes three, I am patting myself on the back and saying, well, you know, it didn't work out, but you know, I'm good for me for going for it, right? And I learned, always learned something from it. I maybe not at that intended cost, but it's for the things you didn't go for. It's always that coulda, woulda, shoulda. You know, it's the ghosts of possibilities. And that's really the kind of procrastination. It, you know, our one true lies, our, 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 our goals, our dreams of what this material of time and existence can be woven into. So I find actually the worst cost of procrastination is here. It's your junior downtime. It's let's say we ever get out of this place. It's called barren tundra to someplace warm again. And we're there and we have earned it and we love it and we have our cerveza and we're lying in the hammock and now we're thinking about work we should be doing. Less happy, less healthy, less wealthy. And that is basically, I think the biggest cost of procrastination. When you should be focused with family, friends, enjoyment, your hobby, and you're thinking about what you should be doing. Now, the reasons for it are myriad. Here's a nice little map for it, but I promised I'd give you an equation. And I know you've been desperately looking forward to that, you know, being so I will get to it quite quickly. As a, as a meta-analysis, my job is to boil everything down to its core, kind of like making scientific soup stock. And when I actually took all these three things and meta-analytically legally boiled off the noise, what I found was the magic number three, Fans of Schoolhouse Rock will have a special, special. I've tried, I did the video for it. It's a surprisingly small audience that really likes Schoolhouse Rock, so I took it away. Um, but the first one is the idea of expectancy or grit or self confidence or, or you know, chutzpah or, or self efficacy. And there's an old saying, and this is a, a bit of a cliche, but if you think you can, you think you can't, you're right. Now, total hyperbole, right? 
That really is, if you think you can't, you're less likely to put in as much effort, which then reduces your chances of success. Doesn't trip off the tongue as nice, though, right? Uh, still, I can do it, but everything's created twice, once first mentally, then physically. You gotta think it through, be able to visualize it, be able to do it. And without that, when you're trying to do something for the first time and only have a vague idea, that can be a real block. Another one is simply that you dislike what you're doing. When you think about what you're putting off, I assume it's not something that excites you or you find wonderful. It's usually something boring. And boredom is nature's way of saying it's irrelevant. So we kind of actually are respecting our, our, our inherent decision-making system that if we don't like it, we shouldn't do it. Third one is the idea of time here, time or delay, that we just don't like our rewards to be certain, high expectancy, and them to be enjoyable, high reward. We like them to be like Veruca Salt from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. We like them to be, I don't care how, and say it mentally with me, I want it now, right? We love now. Now is a tasty sauce to put on any type of reward. Yeah, you know, delaying for chumps. If I could have it today, I will. So again, I can put now all those three elements in there. So when am I motivated? Well, when I have self-confidence and value in something. That's rational gambling. If you ever do gambling, that's really the equation you should go for. And but, and that will make my motivation large. Go figure. But this is the part we actually forget about. Impulsiveness and delay. Impulsiveness is how sensitive you are to time. We're more impulsive, we like it now even more. It's even more savory. Delay is how much long you have to wait for the result. And when we have to wait for the results and we're impulsive, motivation gets really, really small. So we can graph it. Of course, this is a graph. I'll take one of your rewards and I put it in the screen, motivation, time, and we get that element. There we go. We have a deadline in there. Now, it's way off in the distance, right? How, what is your motivation like for it now? I imagine it's small, but what's it gonna be like just before the deadline? I could graph it. I could actually graph an equation and it looks something like this. And you say, no, you're probably something more like this. Where it goes swoops up like a shark's fin or water just sloshing at the bathtub. And that is not convenient, not convenient at all, but that's mathematically how we're designed. So at the time, it's motivation is coming up with an eyedropper, right? You're thirsty and you're skinning a little bit. And before then, you're trying to drink from a fire hose. It's way, way too much motivation. And how much motivation do you want? I'd like a tall glass of motivation, like this much. Is this what I need? Mmm, delicious. But that's not the way they were designed. It's all, it's all, it seems to be all or nothing. Now, if I put temptations there and seeing when they cross, somebody's a little less impulsive in the green line, they cross a little bit more and they start earlier. And how many times have you thought if only had an extra hour or two or a day, right? or five minutes. How much more could I accomplish? Um, however, if we increase temptations, make them more available, you no, know, make them really, the time delay towards the really small, as we have done in constructing our world, this is what happens, right? Further goes higher. And that basically now makes procrastinators of us of all. So it's a worldwide problem because the availability of temptations and delay are so small, their motivation for them goes up so high, it makes it very difficult to concentrate on anything else. The consequence, the one that's most important of these is indeed the impulsivity or sensitivity to time element. The other two are important, but if you're impulsive, that really is driving it. All right, that's, and I don't want to hypnotize you, so I'm going to change off that. It's also similar to genes. It's an adaptive function. It's a temporal delay element. And if you actually can see it in action the way our mind is developed. If you're gonna do a two-part system, you have the amygdala, which you have the, the red little dot in the center on the left and the center of strong emotions. And this is more of our you know, early mammalian dog brain and response to sight, smell, touch, and, and auditory cues. And when you see something, line of cycle gets really excited. So you can think about in the sense of how much a, um, how much when you get your most motivation is when you're the goal becomes tangible, you could feel this presence. 
However, we have the prefrontal cortex, also known as the executive function. And you can think about it being great for making plans in the future. The problem is that both these systems are operating at the same time in all of our heads. So when we actually plan to do something, that's one decision-making system, but system one, the limbic system can trump that. And it tends to trump it until both keys are turned, which happens just before the deadline. So um, for example, you wanna go exercise tomorrow, and that's a good idea, right? We should all exercise a little bit more. That's a prefrontal cortex plan, but you get up and that bed is so cozy and you're tired and the snooze button is right there. And that's a limbic system decision. Boom, right? Because it's here and now. And we constantly have this where the plans of the prefrontal cortex gets trumped overridden by the limbic system, which is all about touch, taste, and hear and what you can sense. So abstract cookies aren't that tempting, but if I bake a nice fresh plate and I put it in front of you, and you have now have the choice, for example, you can smell them. Oh, maybe I'll have one or two, you know, because I might want one for later. And that is basically the source of a procrastination. Now you can see some of this in a fun way. You can try kind of taking one of your left foot and right hand and putting them like this and just turning it if you can see it on my desk. Now try doing them in opposite directions. So one goes in one direction, the other one goes in the other direction. You'll find that really, really hard to do, right? It's, it's basically, it's an idea that there are dual elements to our minds and then we can be ambivalent or the mind can be, be set above, about itself. That's procrastination. Part of your mind wants to do it, part doesn't. Now the entire thing about this is how to get it to go together. Now, as we develop our prefrontal cortex, it works a little better. So kids tend to be the last and last out. They don't have the prefrontal cortex. They need us to particularly help. We also have, for example, people who've had um, brain injuries to the prefrontal cortex to the senior gauge. Oh, are we doing over time? But in the end, the question is, is not just us, it's also where we are. We have developed a world designed around this. Now these aren't the uh, oil sands, but the sands of ancient Egypt. And if you go back about 1500 BC to the time of Thutmosis III, we have some text that doesn't talk about a buried stargate, unfortunately but it does talk about this. And if we give a translation for it, because I think your hieroglyphics are probably rusty at this point, it says, friend, stop working off work, stop putting up work and allow us to go home in good time, which is amazing because we invented work and then we decided we want to put it off, <laughs> right? So it's right there from the beginning, you know? And here's Hesse at APC. They just got their language together he was the world's first economist slash poet. Um, from my understanding of economists, he's the only economist slash poet. So he's kind of unique in that. And translating that is a man who puts up work is always hand grips and ruin. And then we can go through and you can see it in religious texts. You know, that's from the Bhagavad Gita. This is from Buddhism. This is Christianity. Um, all great examples in each of them because no matter what of them, they want you to do something today to get enlightened later. And, you know what's the best time for redemption and putting up eating pork? That's, that's next week, right? So um, it comes along until the Industrial Revolution, about 1750. And then we have Samuel Johnson, and he's writing in the Rambler about this, one of the general weaknesses that prevailed a greater or less degree in every mind. So it was there before him, but now it's really exploding. And as our GDP and our options and our temptations are going on, so goes up procrastination. In fact, in the 1970s, we start, started measuring it formally and we had this. But if you do it today, it would look more like this. A five-fold in chronic procrastination. Of course, it's four to five. It's like everyone's on the top end of the scale, right? And you look about where are we work and where we live and you can think about it, it is a, a, a wonderland of temptation. And everything is actually kind of exploding its most consumable immediate property. You can open this up, consume it now, you can have it. Because catering to the limbic system is really, really profitable. So we have a world which is fine, focused like a laser on trying to make our impulsive side actually kind of go forward. And when we have it pretty much everywhere, 
where all the temptations are instantly available by checkout counters or in seconds from our apps, that is a very difficult place not to procrastinate upon. And these computers, which we're going through right now, are kind of the worst of them all because they're multifunctional devices. And we can do them for work and play. And actually having both of them in the same place is a bad idea. If any of you had problems with sleep, you might actually have to do a sleep hygiene schedule, which says don't bring work into bed. You want to have it for a dedicated purpose. And therefore, it's stimulus cues build up and the bed just in the room does it for you. Sit down. You can have the actually same thing happen for any environment, including your workplace. But if we use it for multiple purposes, we get conflicting cues and it becomes very difficult for us to focus on anything else. It's like, you know, a cat scratching the door. Somebody saying, hey, you know, you want to do, want to get out of here? No, I got work to do. Okay, that's okay. I'll check again in 60 seconds, right? And that is basically what we're happening when we do multiple things in the same place. So we actually have basically built all of ourselves a motivation and toxic workplace. Again, I absolve you of this. It's, it is simply two plus two equals four, right? It is just a consequence of who we are and where we are. You will get this result. Nobody says, oh my gosh, you know, I flipped a match in front of propane and it blew up. It's a propane's fault. No, it is no. No one is going to doing that. It's the propane does what propane does. Matches to do what matches do. So there's even problems when you check your email. It takes approximately 15 minutes to get back into deep um, peak uh, concentrated state, which means if you're checking 50, 50 times a day, you never get in a deep concentrated element, which is actually what you want. So there's a lot of things we can do about this. A lot, actually. I kind of we, this is usually the five actually kind of go through, but there is an entire basically kind of uh, penalty about how to actually change value, how to change expectancy and how to change impulsiveness. And you don't have to do all of them. Sometimes it's just, um, are we about done? I was gonna finish up in the slides. All right, nope, well, anyway. Well, definitely go, go ahead and finish, yeah. Yeah, so you don't have to do them all. Usually, I mean, when somebody is below water and you don't have enough motivation, you, it feels the same whether you're, you know, 10 centimeters or 10 meters below the water. You can, you know, you're not working. And the same thing is when you're above, when you actually have your head above water, you, it's fine whether you're, you're just above and you can have an oxygen or way above. And the idea here is that you don't need to be, you know, kilometers above the sea level to breathe. You sometimes just one or two of these things are actually kind of useful. One of the ones, for example, is about energy. And most people do not use their energy levels wisely in the sense that you only have four to six hours a day of peak energy. It starts in the morning, right after this. And if you use those energy hours, those limited precious time, your power hours carefully, you can really goof off the rest of the day, so to speak, right? Because, um, as they say, you know, if you're swimming with sharks, always bring a friend. Because you'll never swim faster than that shark, right? You don't have to swim be perfect. You just have to be better than your competition. And they're procrastinating too. Okay. Um, we, that's about it. I Usually I have a whole bunch of slides in case they come up that actually specific... Um, different types of techniques. Usually I can end about this one, which is kind of a nice way of kind of going about doing it. Um, again, the idea that this is very, very common. But um, in conclusion, I don't want you to feel angry about your procrastination. Um, I don't want you to feel, the one of the things that prevents people from actually addressing it is guilt and shame. And if you can get past that and just think about this being normal, you'll be, you'll be much, much better off. Also, what you've tried might not have worked, though, but it does. There are lots of techniques out there, as I kind of already briefly alluded to, that actually work really, really well, and you don't need to master them all. The last step is a sense of agency, um, which I cannot give you. Uh, you have to have that sense of agency yourself. If you're, it's like somebody broke into your home, 
No reason. Don't blame yourself about it. They didn't break the home. But you can clean it up. They're not going to come back and do it. You better do it yourself. So um, if you want to know a lot more about it, yes, there's a book on it. It's done pretty well, I suppose. Most people still seem to like it. Um, not everybody, though. Uh, this one, right? Um, you know, here is a very good, useful book. Um, this person thought it was too theoretical, which I like because they misspell every word almost in their sentence. So I'm thinking, yes, that's my one star crowd. Sure, I'll accept that one. Um, just don't say you'll stop doing this tomorrow. 